fact that uh, I, I taught journalism students for some years and um, it, it's as good a way as anything to be sure you have your bases covered in something that you're uh, writing or addressing. Um, I'm going to only sketchily answer uh, some of those, or make a stab at answering some of those questions. Um, and uh, I'm sure that um, many of you uh, know the answers to these questions anyway, um, because it's very recent history. Uh, I'm sure you've all followed it in one way or another, and uh, looking around the room, some of you have been quite involved with it as well, um, and have your own uh, replies and, and reflections and answers to these questions. Uh, but I'll try to make a stab as a basis for discussion. So first of all, we have the origin myth. Now, I'm not using the word myth in the sense of a false story. Um, I'm using it uh, in, in the sense that it can also be a true story, but it's a paradigmatic story, it's a resonant story. And so the story of the Occupy movement is um, in December 2010 in Tunisia, uh, Mohammed Bouzizi set himself on fire and uh, Tunisia uh, rose up uh, and this spread to Egypt. Uh, we all saw the scenes in Tahrir Square. Uh, in Europe then, uh, particularly in Spain, we had the movement of the indignants, the M15 movement. Uh, and then we had Occupy Wall Street, uh, which was the beginning of what we call the Occupy movement, uh, the role of ad busters and uh, all of this. And, uh, and then we had Occupy Everywhere, uh, including uh, here in Ireland. Uh, Occupy Dame Street, Occupy Limerick, Occupy Cork, Occupy Belfast, other places too. Um, and um, so I've, you know, you can tell from looking at me and from, you know, Michal's introduction, I've been around a long time and part of many movements and I've seen many things rise and fall. Uh, but I've never seen anything rise like this, and then fall so fast. It's the sharpest spike of any movement I've ever been involved with uh, in my whole life, and uh, that in itself is something to think about. So anyway, this is, this is the story, um, that uh, people began to protest. People saw each other on the world's airwaves protesting, and one protest gave rise to another. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so in between all of this, there was lots of tweeting, Facebooking, camping, assembling, marching, hoping, arguing, uh, dispersing, regrouping, and here's where we are now. Um, and it's very hard to get exact uh, statistics, and this one, I have to admit it, is from Wikipedia. Um, but uh, it's taken from a, a newspaper source in New Zealand saying that approximately um, there were uh, 2,300 occupations in 2,000 cities. So, um, the, uh, this origin myth, um, it, 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 there, there's, it is the surface truth um, of the Occupy movement. Uh, but I think uh, we have to get beyond the surface truth of it. You have surface events, and you also have underlying forces. And basically, it's the underlying forces that are most important in understanding what the movement is all about. And basically, the Occupy movement is born of crisis and is a response to crisis. That's the essential truth of it. And if Mohammed Bouzizi hadn't set himself on fire in Tunisia, something else would have sparked it off. Because it was only, you know, bubbling from below and, and had to happen, uh, I would argue. Um, and uh, really, it's, the movement is about uh, the current phase uh, of the restructuring of capitalism, I would argue. It's a response to a massive, massive, intensified transfer of wealth uh, from below to above. It's about the subordination of the public sector to the private sector and using the public sector itself as an instrument in stripping the public sector down to enhance the private sector. Uh, and it's, it's, in its own way, it's been a realization that this class war being waged from above needs to be met with class war from below. Um, if any of you remember uh, the film Network, it's, it, it's you know, the, the moment uh, where the broadcaster puts his head out the window and says, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And then all the other people shout back, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I think the Occupy movement has been something like that, 
uh, in, in the nature of it as a movement. And it's been the beginnings uh, of a new level of class consciousness. Now this, you know, 99% versus the 1%, we are the 99%. It's a very rough and ready, very crude articulation of class consciousness. It's, but it's very powerful. It really is very, very powerful. Uh, but there's a need for a much more nuanced analysis. And seen Occupy Dane Street uh, out in Kalimi in the last week uh, has shown us just you know, how much more need for nuance there is in the, 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 this very rudimentary class analysis, class consciousness that's bubbled up um, in the Occupy movement. But it is about uh, class in its way. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of staking out divergent roles, this 99% and the 1%. It's the refusal of this narrative that we're all in it together and that we all have to take equal consequences. We all partied all of this. The Occupy movement has been a refusal of that narrative, which is very important. Uh, and, and, you know, not just here, everywhere. There's, there's, there, have, there have been all of these betrayals. There have been forces that come forward as the forces that will act in the name of people, of the people in a time of crisis. Uh, certainly in the, the US presidential election, uh, Obama came forward and promised to take the side of Main Street over Wall Street and then immediately, immediately did exactly the opposite and chose Wall Street over Main Street. And that's been a lot of the power of Occupy Wall Street uh, in the US. Here, you know, people uh, thought they, some people must have thought they could solve the problems of the crisis in our society uh, by going to, uh, to vote uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 in the last election. Some people, I don't know how they thought so, but they thought that Fine Gael and more people thought Labour somehow would act in their own interest in, in this crisis. And if people don't feel betrayed, they, they aren't awake. And then there are also divergent roads uh, within this movement itself. It is a genuine grassroots movement. But like a lot of genuine grassroots movements, it occupies a very, very broad spectrum. Uh, in terms of political philosophies, uh, there are anarchists, Marxists, social democrats, uh, very right-wing nationalists in some cases, and many, many people who are undeveloped and undefined in their political philosophies. But the movement itself has brought them into a milieu where they want to develop and define their political philosophy. And most of them are feeling more attracted uh, to anarchism uh, than to any other of the political philosophies on, on the spectrum uh, in the Occupy movement. Uh, the, the various different kinds of people. There are people of all ages and all walks of life, um, different genders, uh, all, all sorts of people um, became attracted to the Occupy movement. Uh, and, uh, and, I'm, and just ev every sort of way you would divide people, there, there, there was diversity. Uh, you had some people who were sane, mature, uh, principled, and others who were not sane, not mature, not principled. Um, and, um, you know, people who are poisonous, uh, crazy, uh, perhaps agents provocateurs. Uh, it, 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 and and the, the, the immediate experience of people who became involved in the Occupy movement was a great solidarity, but as well as these uh, new solidarities, there were also almost immediately uh, splits um, of various sorts. And, and with this kind of diversity, that was almost inevitable. And so then the story is how did those things play themselves out? And um, how they played themselves out at Occupy Dame Street was you know, particularly fraught. That was the, the, the image there, um, is the very first day some of you were there um, at Occupy Dame Street. And I, I look back on that day, the 8th of October, with great fondness. Uh, because it, so much seemed possible, it was all open, um, it was a, 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 a new story, a new process beginning. Um, and the, 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 the problems then came in day two um, and, and sort of went on, on a steep upward curve after that. But 
Um, I, I remember day one as a, you know, a particularly happy and hopeful and, and harmonious day. Uh, there were about 300 people there. Uh, most people didn't know each other. Uh, I mean, I've been involved in the VAP for years and only a handful of people I knew for many years. Uh, of the people that I did already know, a lot of them I had met on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and uh, some of them I only met on, on that day, though they became a very important part of my life in the months that followed. So um, I'm going to try to look at the global movement, uh, but also kind of uh, reflect to some extent on my active participation um, in and critical reflection on Occupy Dame Street. Uh, but I've, I've written my way through this at great length. I wrote an article that appeared in uh, Irish Left Review, it's about 10,000 words about exactly what happened at Occupy Dame Street and the odd chance that, on the odd chance that somebody here has actually read it, I'll try not to repeat myself, but if somebody does want to, you know, look at a, a more elaborate account, um, giving an experiential narrative and, you know, critical reflection on Occupy Dame Street, there is this published version there. So uh, I, I, I put the weight of my efforts uh, into organizing um, Occupy University. Uh, on the first day, though, this wasn't part of the plan at all. I mean, the whole week before Occupy started, uh, I, like other people that were um, involved in organizing it, spent all, the, uh, all our efforts just trying to get people to come and to Occupy Dane Street. And we didn't really have much of a plan for what we were going to do once we got people there. But once we were, because we didn't even know if we still would be there on day two. But on day two, we were still there, and then we thought, okay, you know, we don't know how long we're going to be there. What are we going to do now that we're here? And the first uh, idea I had was, because I'm, you know, from the 60s, and we had all these teachings, like, let's have teachings. Uh, but if I had had the idea, somebody else would have. Most occupies did have uh, a series of, of teachings. It's one of the, you know, obvious things uh, to do. Um, and uh, I thought they, they were kind of like I, I imagined the hedge schools would be. We thought of them as, as, as something like hedge schools versus hedge funds. And uh, in the course of two months, we had 78 uh, talks and workshops right there on the street in Dave Street. Uh, very, very high quality uh, lectures and lecturers. Uh, some of these people in this room uh, and speaking at this conference. Um, lectured there, Terence McDonough, who just walked in, Michael Taft, Connor McCabe, uh, Tom Boland, um, uh, Andy Story, who's to come, uh, Marnie Holbrook. Um, and uh, it, it, it wasn't an easy gig uh, because there was, you know, all the hustle of the street, the, the noise of the fire engines and the buses. Um, there were, you know, I think every, um, alcoholic or uh, drug addict in Dublin seemed to wander by at some stage, you know, demanding that we give our attention exclusively to them. And uh, there were just all, you know, all kinds of, of, of problems on the street. And then in terms of the audience, um, uh, there were people who, you know, were university professors and people who left school at 14. And most of the lecturers really pitched their talk extremely well uh, to engage that diversity of audience while still keeping them university level talks. Because in a lot of the occupied movements, a lot of the talks were, you know, uh, workshops in shamanism and rebirthing and stuff like this. And that stuff did go on at Occupy Dame Street, but we didn't schedule it as Occupy University. We meant this to be real university, but accessible to people uh, who weren't necessarily part of the university population. Um, and, uh, and, and really, you know, I said everybody that I, that to everybody, I'm sorry, look, anything could happen, um, and, and, and it usually did. Uh, sometimes the discussions were really well focused, other times they went absolutely all over the place. Uh, there were people who came and didn't listen to the lecture and then just used it as an opening to give their own lecture. Uh, we had currency crazies and fluoride fanatics and you know, every kind of conspiracy theorist in the world, you know, coming in and, and promoting their theories. But I think, you know, in, 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 in the midst of all that, real learning, I think, took place. And it was a, a, an alternative education. I mean, because one of the ideas of the Occupy movement was to be, you know, some prefiguring of an alternative mode of social organization. And this was people, you know, coming together and giving and receiving food and drink and shelter and knowledge free of the circuitry of commodification. 
Uh, and I think that's, you know, that, that's something to be proud of. So, um, okay, the rise and fall of uh, Occupy Dame Street. Again, I'm going to, you know, make this very short, because it's a, even though it's, it was only a short time, it's a long, complicated story. And uh, as I said, I've written it, so you can read the written version. <coughs> um, but basically, there are two conflicting narratives about the rise and fall of Occupy Dame Street, and I'm a partisan of one of these two narratives. Um, now, there's much convergence on the story of the rise of Occupy Dame Street and total divergence uh, about the fall uh, of Occupy Dame Street. The story of the rise is, on day one, is another picture of the day one. We all gathered in hope and harmony uh, to build a movement, you know, open-ended, full of promise, you know, to, to resist these global forces that were gathering, that had gathered against us and were bearing down upon us. We gathered to take back the world that had been taken away from us. Um, we had our general assemblies. Uh, we had a, a camp. We had these university talks on the street. We had marches. We had music. Uh, but from day two, there was increasing disharmony. Um, there were people constantly saying, um, no, no politics. You know, leave, leave your political philosophies at the door. And, you know, I would, you know, engage in arguments. You know, a person's political philosophy isn't something that you leave the door, aside from the fact that we didn't even have a door. Um, and it's neither left nor right. And, you know, this no politics here um, was, was, was very grating and, and uh, confused. But, you know, they were young people, they were confused, and you hope that you could, you know, bring clarity to the confusion. Um, I think a lot of us, you know, were university teachers, were motivated, motivated to, to do that. And these were people who had stepped up and wanted to do something about the world and were, you know, trying to uh, argue with and, and work with. Um, so the story of the fall. Um, the people who are still calling themselves Occupy Dame Street that were still there until the, the 8th of March, this would be their story. Uh, people came and they spoke at assemblies, but they didn't camp. Uh, the trade unions and the organized left tried to take it over. There was an intellectual elite um, who thought they knew better. Uh, the weather that got cold and those who didn't have the stomach for it went away. Um, so the assemblies, the marches, the talks, and all the activity on, on, on Dame Street uh, ended and there was only the camp. Uh, but they felt very strongly uh, that it would somehow bloom again in the spring. Um, and the fact that, you know, even when spring came, there were really only, you know, 12 to 20 of them still there. Um, they, they thought that only proved that, you know, they were the bravest and the best. They were the heroes of the revolution. And all the other people were, you know, just, you know, weak and, you know, whatever. Um, so they stayed, they did uh, the odd direct actions. They actually did very little but just sit there and camp and, you know, give out about everybody else. Uh, and then they were evicted on the 8th of March. That's their narrative. Here's the, the second narrative, uh, and I'm a total partisan of this narrative. Um, the, the, the tension from, from day two, there was a tension between the camp and the movement. And a lot of this is structurally understandable. Um, the people who were free to camp had, did have a disproportionate voice in uh, defining the movement um, and because they were there, you know, more of the time. Um, but, uh, you know, they weren't necessarily the best people to define and to build the movement. Um, from the beginning, I, I wanted this to be a movement of people who, you know, um, had jobs and kids and complicated lives and could, you know, give what they could to it. And, and, you know, were unlikely to be free to camp. Um, so there was this structural tension there from the beginning. But it did give a dis because it was a, a movement grounded in a camp, it did give a disproportionate voice to, to people who would camp. And, and that played itself out from, from day two in a pretty destructive way, as it turned out. Um, and then these same people uh, who were free to camp tended to be people who also were extremely ignorant uh, and even hostile uh, to trade unions and to the organized left. Um, some of the pe and, and there was an obsession with the SWP in particular. And some of the people who became most obsessed with the SWP 
from day two, had to ask, you know, on day two, who is the SWP? Um, and so um, a lot of it, uh, you know, uh, there are things the SWP could have could have done better, but they did not make an overt attempt to take over the Occupy movement. They they tried, they took place, they uh, took part in the assemblies and marched. They argued certain lines, uh, and and I often agreed with some of the things they were arguing. Um, but there was not an overt attempt of the trade unions and the organized left to take over the Occupy movement. The Dublin Council of Trade Unions, in good faith, uh, sent an invitation uh, to Occupy Dane Street to help uh, or to, to participate in a march. They were already planning uh, for the 26th of November, and that was that, that was a, that turned out, although it was in good faith, to be extremely divisive. We had acrimonious assembly after acrimonious assembly about this DCGU invitation. Um, uh, there was also um, um, a great deal of anti-intellectualism, a really stunning lack of historical consciousness, this sense that 2011 was year zero, and nobody else in the history of the world had ever done anything like what was being done by the Occupy movement. Um, they had no sense that, you know, there actually were occupations in Ireland before. Um, and, and a lot of what I saw Occupy University doing was addressing this lack of historical consciousness and bringing a knowledge of, of the history of social movements. I mean, our big theme in Occupy University was the nature of the global financial system. Uh, but another of our big themes uh, was the history of, of social movements. And, um, and a lot of people did really learn a lot from that. And uh, some, of, some of the young people who said that they had an inadequate knowledge of history. Their participation in this movement wanted them to learn that. They wanted to sort of see <coughs> their stu the, the story of this movement within the context of a longer story. But some of them know they absolutely, that, that everything started with them and they didn't want to know about anything that happened before they arrived on the scene. Um, and so uh, there was also, there were some people that, uh, you know, uh, were experts in process, and so we have to have consensus on everything. That sounded very good, and I said, okay, let's give it a go. They said, this really does work. I said, okay. But what it turned out to be uh, was a dictatorship of a minority, uh, because there was a blocking mechanism, and if only one or two people disagreed with something, they could block it. And that's what happened with uh, the, the refusal of the invitation from the Dublin Council of Trade Unions. It was blocked by a small minority, and a number of other things were blocked. And that led to you know, a great deal of bitterness, and, and many people just went away. People who were active trade unionists, people who had jobs, people who had other things to do, just went away um, in, in, in the first two months. So uh, basically, you know, there was this uh, dissipation of the potential uh, to build the movement of resistance, and there was a degeneration of the project long before the eviction. In the new year, they were just sitting there in this wooden structure, you know, just you know, talking to each other. They weren't even reaching out, talking to people on the streets who wanted to come and make contact with the Occupy movement. Because it's a brilliant idea in its way to have a place that's there 24-7 where people can come and make contact in their own time and way. But they weren't even, they weren't even doing that in the last months. Um, and how far it's degenerated is shown by their response to the eviction of this very wealthy couple with all these multiple properties uh, in Kalini. They, uh, they went and they, they occupied the sheriff's office um, in, in response to that. They say they shut down the sheriff's office, but they didn't. They did a little direct action. Then they went out to Kalini to show their solidarity uh, with this property couple. So anyway, um, to conclude, start to conclude, um, the continuing story of the Occupy movement is not over. As I said, it's a been a very sharp uh, wave, a, a really big wave that rose very quickly and is now crashing. Uh, but it is continuing. Um, there's a, a, the, the, the same people that were involved in Occupy Dane Street to form the Dublin Occupy Network. Uh, they're, you know, connecting with the organized left and with the trade union movement, uh, for example, in planning May Day uh, next week. Uh, the same people are also involved in Unlock NAMA, uh, doing a lot of research about NAMA, um, trying to just 
close the secrets of NAMA, and also, so far, we occupied one NAMA building um, and had it. <coughs> the idea was we just do it for a day and have an economic seminar. And uh, we only got halfway through it before the guards came and evicted us. Uh, Occupy University uh, is continuing. Uh, we have a series of, on five Wednesdays in May, a uh, series of lectures on the history of radical social movements. And a lot of the, the new activists uh, really are, are into this. Um, and, you know, ODS continues doing uh, what it ineptly does now. Um, Occupy Limerick and Occupy Cork um, had the sense to disband, uh, to make their own decision to disband, uh, which I think is very good. Other ones go on uh, in different ways. In the US, the Occupy movement goes on. There, there are a number of fault lines uh, playing out. Uh, there's a move to have a big general strike on the 1st of May. Uh, I'm getting mixed messages about this from the people I know there. It's, you know, it's a very problematic thing to organize a general strike uh, without organized labor, although organized labor does have some involvement with you know, some sections of the Occupy movement and hasn't totally condemned it. So you know, it's a new thing, and it'll be interesting to see. Um, and and you know, what happened with the one-day general strike in Oakland was you know, quite interesting um, some months ago. Um, and there's another group called 99% Spring that some people say is co-opting the Occupy movement for the Obama campaign. Other people say, no, it's not doing that at all. And you know what I mean? It's, it's got very complex and, and, and fractured, but there's still an energy there. Um, and uh, e even now in this downward curve. And I think what, ha what has emerged into the world as a result of the Occupy movement will still continue to be there. So what did it achieve? Um, I think it raised global consciousness uh, about the nature of the global economic system and how it bears down on the lives of ordinary people. And those ordinary people, many, many of them, have said, you know, we're, we're not going to be silent any longer. We're awake now and we're speaking. And that has not gone away, uh, no matter what evictions and splits and, and everything else have, have occurred. Uh, it's for, okay, you know, uh, it's, it, there are these splits, um, but it has forged new bonds of solidarity. There are people who are working together now who did not know each other before the Occupy movement started and will continue to work with each other. And beyond these groups of people who are working, who have, you know, met face to face and are working together, um, there's also the sense of people that we don't know face to face, but we know are out there. There is a sense of new bonds of solidarity having been forged. There are people in motion in the world who are part of whatever is going to happen now. And that has not gone away and will not go away anytime soon. There's been experimentation with new forms uh, from which we've learned a lot about new things that work and new things that don't work very well. Um, and you know, wh whatever the next form of, of what comes directly out of this movement, um, I hope we'll have learned from that. Uh, and it's opened new paths of future activism. As I say, there are people who have become active that are going to continue, who weren't active before, who are going to continue to be active now, no matter what happens to what, anything that's labeled the Occupy movement. Um, and it has to continue because the problems giving rise to the Occupy movement are still there. Not a single problem that the Occupy movement came on this stage of history to address has been solved. And yet people have got in motion addressing this problem with other people and, and, and will continue to do that. So the problems are all still there and there, there's more of a need for a movement to protest and resist than ever. Um, but I think, I mean I thought this from day one, but I think more people who have become involved in this now realize that it has to be part of a complex, protracted struggle. I mean, on day one, I got up and said, look, don't, you know, don't get too focused on occupations and demands, and particularly don't believe that this occupation is going to meet, the, you know, um, to uh, make these demands happen, um, is going to achieve these demands. Um, that's not the case, and I think more people realize that it's, what, what, isn't, what's, what needs to happen is a very long, complex, protracted struggle, and I think that will, that will continue. So it's subject to ebb and flow. There's, 
you know, a steep wave, the tide is going out, but this, you know, the, the process is still going on, and I think a, a new wave of, of protest and resistance will come, as well as this, this long, protracted process. So there are my reflections on it um, at this stage.